Hello, I'm Ronnie Eldridge. Welcome to Eldridge & Company. General Motors' announcement of factory closures made me want to talk to Les Leopold, the executive director of the Labor Institute, a research and educational organization. His book, Runaway Inequality, an activist guide to economic justice, is now the curriculum for a movement to bring an all-inclusive justice to working people. And it's really very good. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me. So, in two seconds, because we have a lot to talk about, what does the GM closure tell us? Well, it tells or Illustrate. Us, okay. What it illustrates is we had an opportunity to uh, control what GM was going to be as a corporation because we bailed them out with yeah. over $50 billion of taxpayer money. And we expected, at least I did, that they would reinvest in green production and pay back their workers for the sacrifices they made. They took big, they took $11 billion of wage cuts and benefit cuts. You know what they have done? Uh, they, this plant uh, shutdown is actually designed to give them about $2 billion, $2 to four, $3 billion of, of extra money. They paid themselves $10 billion in stock buybacks, which should have been outlawed. Stock buybacks increase the price of the share for the largest hedge funds that own parts of the GM and for their top executives. It's just padding your own pockets. And they're going to lay off 14,000 uh, workers. Okay. And they gave $10 billion to themselves, basically. This is outrageous. And it could have been all outlawed because GM would have accepted uh, bylaws, whatever we told them. They would have said, yes, fine, great. No stock buybacks, great. Re uh, certain percentage of R&D, yes. They would have accepted all that. Workers on the board, worker and community representatives on the board of directors, they would have accepted all that. Instead, now they, they are a uh, taxpayer runaway corporation. And it was exacerbated, right, by the tax cuts, the recent, oh, that's. That is a riot. The, the tax cut, uh, uh, it was supposed to be, right, a reinvestment in uh, uh, plant, equipment, research, you know, get, uh, lower the tax, corporate tax for 35% to 21%. That extra money is supposed to go and it, to workers' wages and, and, and investment. Here's what happened. We now know over the last uh, 10 months, roughly, uh, about $7 billion went to one-time bonuses and wage increases for working people. $200 billion, roughly $200 billion went to stock buybacks. And that accounts for what you talk about in the disparity of incomes, that CEOs earn 800 times 800. more than and the average worker, has which is the incentive then to have the bottom right. line to make the profit. And exactly. And here, there was a transformation that began uh, in the late 70s, 19, around 1980. And it was, uh, at that point, the ratio between top CEOs and the average workers were 40 to 1. Now it's 800 to 1. Big difference. I mean, think about what that means. You can afford one home they can afford 40. Now they can afford 800. I mean, it's outrageous. Well, the, the, what happened was there was this whole uh, uh, more complex story about uh, the unleashing of corporate America through deregulation. And what happened was when, when, when these corporate raiders started buying up corporations with borrowed money, et cetera, et cetera, they changed the way CEOs were paid. Up until that point, about 95% of a CEO's pay were salary and bonuses, about 5% uh, stock incentives. Now it's completely flipped around. Uh, over 85% are stock is stock incentives. So if you're a CEO and you're going to work every day, all you care about is the price of the stock. You don't get the stuff about stakeholders and all that. There's only one stakeholder, the stock owner, which is you and the, the, the largest uh, hedge funds and private equity companies that have positions in your company. And what all of you want are to take as much money out of the corporation as possible and go into the market and buy back the shares to boost their price. That's all anybody thinks about. Are, are stock options considered income when they file taxes? Uh, when, they're, when they use them. When they use them. Yes. But hedge funds are not, they're taxed on capital gain. What, what are they taxed on? Oh, that's a, 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 I, cop, that, that's a complicated story. I know, it's story. a whole other book. Yeah, <laughs> they, they've, no, but they've been able to, uh, hedge funds have been able to get a sweetheart deal where uh, their income, they get like a 2% fee of all the profits for administering mm -hmm. it, et cetera. And then they get a piece of the action up to 20, 30, mm -hmm. 40%. And that's considered capital gains, even though it's mm -hmm. income.
so they get a lower, even a lower tax rate. Uh, you know, it, 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 you put all this together and you're going to get an incredible crisis, not just here, but in the, in the Western, uh, most of the Western world. You're going to get worker wages for a whole generation flat or going down in terms of real buying power. And you see this astronomical rise in the top 1% and the top fraction of the 1%. So people know that they've been, they haven't been getting ahead for a generation. If you go into rural America, you will see, basically, you'll understand why there's an opiate crisis. By yeah. the way, the, the opiate deaths looks exactly like the runaway inequality line. There were very few, and then it shot through just as inequality rose and rose. There's nothing there. The you know, largest industries in rural America, I think, from my you know, limited travels and research, seems to be the hospital, if you have a regional hospital, and a prison, if you're lucky enough to have the prison. All the factories are, just look like shells. There are very few of them that are Those operating. are the places to work, you mean. Yeah. yeah, the, yeah. So, obviously, our capitalism doesn't work for most people. <laughs> when are we ever going to realize that? And do you think out of the ashes that Trump has created, it's going to rise up? Uh, <laughs> you know, that's kind of music to my ears. I hope that happens. But <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm concerned because I'm concerned at how the Democratic Party is responding to the crisis. Because uh, an economist once said, uh, uh, made a crack that I think is true. He says, it's very hard for a party to be a party of the predators and a party of the prey. And as long as the Wall Street Democrats have such a foothold in the Democratic Party, you're not going to see broad-based class economic policies. You're not going to see the GM-type uh, situation addressed because they don't want to see stock buybacks uh, eliminated. They don't want to see higher taxes on themselves, right? So they have a, a, a tremendous influence, and they had a tremendous influence over Hillary Clinton, and they have a tremendous influence over a large segment of the Democratic Party. And the scary thing is, It'll just be anti-Trump, and it won't be for something. And I think that's very... And also, it seems to me, in my, and I was thinking about it the other day, because just in my own little circle, the managing company of a gym that I know sent to the, the building I live in, they, we have a contract, but they, they said, well, sorry, we have to charge you, I don't know how much, $30,000 more, because we've had to raise the minimum income. And then I got a letter the other day from our newspaper delivery service. They're very sorry, but they're going to have to increase the cost because of the raise in the minimum income. So here we have Democratic politicians who lead the fight for a mini minimum income, but it's going to get passed right along to the consumer anyway. And, and if you look at... Uh, <laughs> and it's not, as you say, the heart of the problem. Well, and just to, to reinforce your point, and on top of it all, the average wage is Doesn't not going up for yeah. it's not it's barely keeping up with inflation now and, right. and this is the, the the sort of the peak of the recovery yeah unemployment is 3.7 percent we should be in a situation where all those costs wages are going up and the costs are being passed on and inflation is taking off we're not there why is that they're not really giving it uh, they're using that uh, minimum wage to extract you know money for, for you know you. this book was written years ago before trump was even president Correct, but we're now in our third, pr proud to say we're in our third edition. So. It's so great, and it's so interesting and so important for people to read because I think it's written so well and it's so basic to what the problem is. Well, and it's not, it, you talk about silos of special interest, and that's too much, determ that determines too much policy, I think, as far as we're concerned. Everything is interrelated, and everything comes back down to the economy and capitalism, the way we have it. And, and, and I'm and, getting to sound like such a radical, no, I can't believe it. It's just, nobody knows what the alternative to capitalism is. But we know that there can be a more humane uh, form of capitalism. Is form that of what you call compassionate capitalism? No, I call it social democracy. Social democracy. Which uh, uh, in Northern Europe uh, uh, worked really right. well. You know, the wage gap there is much, much smaller. The, bene the average benefit for, uh, you know, the average working people person has, you know, free higher education, pretty, very, very inexpensive. But what's universal. happening in France? Well, you, there you have a situation where they're reacting to a president who gave tax breaks to the super rich and tried to increase consumer That's taxes right. on, you know, yeah. he, he's, he's oblivious to runaway inequality. Right. Uh, but, you know, the, the, uh, there's so much more we could do 
uh, without like giving up free enterprise and you know taking away individual liberty. That's all that BS stuff. We don't have to fight that. You know, having uh, universal health care is not radical. Having free higher education is not radical. We had free higher education in New York and California, you know, a generation ago. You know, you could go to this university here for free. A whole, a whole generation of GIs went to 7 million people, went to university for free after World War II. We can do that. And we could also have change into this green economy. We've got such opportunity facing us. Right? Absolutely. This it's idea essential. of a Green New Deal, I think, is, is, is it's uh, may have legs. Yeah, it is interesting because uh, 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 if it's coupled also, we're talking about this in New Jersey right now, where the governor said he's in favor of a public bank, but it's nowhere to be found. So we're thinking of putting together a little bit of a, um, a movement on that. And What's a public bank? A public bank. There's only one public bank in the country. Right. North. Bank of North Dakota. That's right. <laughs> All the way back from the Populist and the Nonpartisan League, 1919. And what it does is instead of, uh, 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 it provides a whole series of programs, but it has like a small business loan for every $100,000 it loans out. Uh, it demands one new permanent job in the state of North Dakota, which has always had the lowest unemployment rate because the bank pours the money back into the state. Uh, half of its profits or more go back into the state treasury. The rest goes for retained earnings so they can expand. They have lower, they have a lower uh, rate student loans. They have a program where uh, every first generation kid that's applying to college for the first time in their family gets their fees paid for, their application fees, and so on. They can do things for the good of the state. If, a, if they need to build another bridge or you know, another school, they don't have to go to Wall Street and do a bond issue. The public bank can handle it. So we want to do something like that in New Jersey. And one of the programs that we're talking about, one of the focuses, and maybe the focus, might be it being a green bank where the money goes to uh, you know, refurbish uh, uh, solar programs for homes, for businesses, co-generation, uh, all kinds of, you know, green-oriented uh, projects. So uh, we, we think there might be a constituency for that. Under the auspices of the Institute. Yes. You guys are going around the country talking to different groups of people about this runaway e inequality and what it means. I mean, how it it's racist, it's everything, right? Right, we, we, we've been very, we got very lucky here. Uh, we put together this uh, book and, and, and several uh, community groups and trade unions, uh, Communication Workers of America put up like a million dollars a year to spread the program. We train 80 of their people to be trainers. CIS in Action New York, New Jersey Education Association is a group in Pensacola, Florida. There's another group in uh, Wilmington, North Carolina, another group in Michigan. And we've now trained three, four, five hundred trainers who go out and do it up to eight hours, uh, all in this sort of participatory uh, non-lecture methodology. And I go, I'm like the bird dog. I go around speak at the biggest groups. I don't take a fee. I, instead, I ask that they buy at wholesale a copy of book for everyone there. And I've been, I've been speaking to, you know, 10, 15, 20 plenaries a year or more. Uh, and, out of, and at the end, we ask how many people would like to be part of this program and would like to be trained as trainers. And usually a you know, large number of people volunteer. They go to our website, runawayinequality.org, and they, they sign up. We never try to raise money from anybody. Uh, we just we provide a little bit of information every couple of weeks to the mailing list. But if we get enough people in a certain area, we'll do a train the trainer program, a two-day program to train them to become trainers. And the curriculum's on the website in Spanish and in English for free. But the message that you, you touched before that I think is the key, we're trying to convince people who are, who are basically entirely committed to their issue, silo, we call it silo, like environment or civil rights or just labor issues or just you know gay, lesbian, uh, uh, community type issues. We're trying to get them to see the interconnectedness of all these issues through runaway inequality because we're not gonna win anything until we have a movement that's broad enough to bring us all together. We're not gonna be a series of individual issues kind of rushing at the political system. You know, we haven't been doing so well. I mean, I, I talk to environmentalists, I say, well, okay, your single focus on uh, climate change, which I totally agree with, but if you don't connect it to the broader economics, what happens? We all get picked off. How are you doing right now? How, how are we doing? We've got a deniers all over the place. We've pulled out of the Paris Accords. Maybe it's time to rethink the strategy to connect with a broader group of people. And you can do this with runaway inequality. We had a fantastic workshop, a day and a half, with uh, 
environmentalists in the Bay Area and oil refinery workers. And we had it at a union hall at an oil refinery. And it was unbelievable. They had never met each other, never talked to each other. And the last exercise we did, we had that, we said, uh, imagine that you are the executive board of a new progressive alliance in California of labor and environmentalists. And you have to, here's a draft joint statement. You have to uh, work it so that you either agree or don't agree, make it work for you. They spent, we couldn't get them to stop. They took the exercise so seriously. They're wordsmithing and they're changing it. You know, yes, we agree on climate change, but we also think that refineries, if we're going to have them, ought to be in the United States because they'll be cleaner and they'll, you know, there'll be less of a, a transportation carbon footprint. It got very sophisticated. And it got so sophisticated, I got a call the next day from one of the environmentalists. They said, I've been looking online for uh, Progressive Alliance of California. This is a make-believe <laughs> exercise. He says, which one is ours and when does the statement come out? <laughs> So people want to come together, but there are very few venues to do this. And, and, and we're one of the groups that will bring the Trump people or the people who voted for Trump out of protest, basically, those union people, working class people. We talk to them. That's our job. We talk to them and we try to bring them together with more progressive single issue groups to see if they can find their common ground. That's what runaway inequality training is about. And, and that's what we do through the website, runawayinequality.org. It's a great website. So all of this leads then into politics, obviously. And I, I'm assuming that people who come out of this understand the need for political. Oh, they sure do. Right. Um, at, at some point, you kind of int intimate that maybe a third party, but not really, right? Uh, but, you know, as an old I, We reform, can't afford it, it right We can't, now. right. As a reformer within the Democratic Party for many years, that's where it has to come, right? Well. Uh, Trump has to be defeated. Yeah. Uh, we cannot go on with another four years. God only knows what he'll do in another four years. I, 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 what I'm really worried about, he's finally going to realize that his popularity depends on having a war or something, okay. right? Something serious like that where he can rally the people around him because, he, you know, he's, he's going to get, uh, the judicial mm. system is mm. forming a noose around his neck right now. So uh, winning, I, I think, I think uh, the long run we can talk about a third party uh, if the Democrats, you know, fail to reform themselves. Mm -hmm. But in the short run, we need, I think we need somebody that appeals both to the sort of social justice side of the Democratic Party and to the economic justice side and forget about the Wall Street Democrats. I think they, that's the group that the Democratic Party has to start to forget right. about because it's very easy to see a, a Already commentators are saying, well, look at this last election. It was young people and women and minorities and Republican upper income. women, they always say, yeah, that always right. is a very important thing to them, suburban women. Suburban women which and then, more upper income people. And we should forget about the so-called white working class, which, by the way, doesn't really exist anymore. There are almost no facilities in the country that are all white. Mm -hmm. But OK, forget about those working people. I've heard that from Democratic folks on TV. I mean, they're not. They're not hiding this. And I think that's a recipe for disaster. I think we need a candidate that can do both, like Sherrod Brown, for example. That's and my I know, candidate. I know, there you go. <laughs> I, you know, I feel almost sheepish because I'm a Bernie guy, but uh, I'm starting to think that we have to, I, I'd like to see what, how Sherrod Brown does in a con very contested national. But he has to decide he wants to run. He has to decide. I, and, I, I'm thinking he's going to decide And yes. that means that people have to encourage him. I think I think he's getting plenty of encouragement. You, you win you win by, you know, six eight points in in, in Ohio when, right. when the governor's losing by four or six points. Right. Shows you've got some power. He's always been able to cut across the classes. He can talk to working people. Yeah. I mean, he the, he 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 can he actually is uh, uh, on their side. I did a press conference with him. It was sort of the steel workers brought me down because they wanted somebody. I, uh, we had another institute at the time, a second one called the Public Health Institute, so they brought me down for a press conference with him. It was a little embarrassing for me because he gets up, I can't even remember what it was about, but he like reads a statement. I'm sort of winging it, you know, and he's like, <laughs> he's I, I figure it was business. a Q&A. No, he's all business. <laughs> very nice. Very, very well very, prepared. And he's also uh, very congenial and very thankful. Right. And he's a, he's a good politician. And he looks like a good guy. Well, he, he can talk <laughs> to working people. That's a terrible thing to say. But he see, he, he actually believes that the, he, that the plight of working people should be addressed as opposed to worrying about, you know, the Wall Street Democrats. You know, he understands that there's, there's a deep bitterness in, in society about what happened in 2008 and the, the, this runaway inequality and the crash and we Excuse bailed me. out Wall Street and then ended up, 
you know, losing our homes and, and, all, and jobs and everything else. Uh, it, he can speak to that incredible deep-seated resentment and I think channel it into something positive. And at the same time, address the social issues Look, I, in the best way, right? Yeah, I, 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 if anybody's going to listen to him, his voting record and Bernie Sanders are very close. Bernie, look, Bernie, Bernie's terrific as well. I'm just afraid that his ship he, has sailed. He, 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 you know, I voted for him too, but he did his job. He did a great job. He tried. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I think that it's time to move on. I, I agree with you that the Democratic people in the Democratic Party worry me with the who decides which way it's going to go? You know? Well, I think, see, it's very Darwinian. There's, there's, there's two elections. There's the election for money, where you have to compete. Uh, so who's gonna, are you going to get enough money to run? So, so the funders, the, the donors. But then, you know, what Bernie showed is you can do it with mass support. You don't need to rely on so the fundraisers. Did Beto. Yeah, so did Beto. And then there's the primary where you actually have to get votes. Uh, and, uh, you know, the... It, it's, it's very grueling, and all your flaws come out when you're in that, on those debates and all the, you know, you have to talk all the time, and you can easily stick your foot in your mouth and end up being drummed out. I don't like calling people the left and the right. I really can't stand that, and I don't like the term progressive, but anyway. Um, who speaks for the left part of the party these days? You know, it, 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 it's, it's hard to say. There's a lot of new congressmen that got elected on, and women on, we have on, to see. Uh, yeah. on, on uh, platforms. I mean, that, that's also a battle about who speaks for. Uh, I, I mean, if you want to be straight out honest across the country, Bernie probably speaks for more than anybody else. He probably has the largest reservoir of support. Uh, and I think that's why he's planning to run. Because you think he's really planning to run? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I haven't seen anything that he's done that doesn't look like he's, uh, run. And I'll tell you, it's going to be uh, very hard for someone like me not to support him because I agree with everything that he stands for. But I'm worried about his ability uh, uh, to. W well, we'll see how he does in the elections, but to withstand the uh, uh, Trump onslaught. Beto, Beto, I think should. My my personal opinion is you should win an election first. And what I'm worried about there is. Obama ran better than he did in the rural counties in Texas. And you need to run better than 20%. You need to be more like, you can't win those counties, but you need to be able to go 30, 40, 45%. Otherwise, if you keep losing 90, 10, 80, 20 in these little counties, it adds up. You can't overcome that in the urban areas. So uh, I'm concerned about why that happened. I, I'm just looking at, you know, analyzing the results now. Obama ran 40% in those counties in Texas. He ran 20%. I think he's got to win something first. Right. I want to go back a little bit to when capitalism <clears throat> or factory owners, for instance, there was, it wasn't the same. There was a conscience about everything, wasn't there? About well, there, the community, there, about the, there what, were, the workers there was a, were getting? Look, the, the, uh, you know, capitalism uh, has been here, you know, for pretty much from the start, right? And uh, it got tamed beginning during, uh, well, it started with the pro progressive right. era, populist party, progressive right. era, then, then it sort of culminated right. after the crash in 29 during the New Deal. And there was a rebalancing of power. Labor got, finally got, you know, they'd been, it'd been outlawed up until then, virtually, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, started to get some real power. And then World War II, it seemed like there was going to be a cooperative effort between big government, big labor, big corporations. And uh, although there, there were lots of uh, uh, labor actions and strikes and, you know, nothing, n it was never ideal, the standard of living after World War II for the average working person after, in real buying power went up with productivity year by year by year. And, corpor you know, corporations were making rich, I don't know about you, I, you're... You remember in the 60s, people, there were plenty of rich people around. It wasn't like we eliminated uh, ca uh, capitalism, but, uh, when it, it, but it was tightly controlled. So uh, Wall Street was very tightly controlled. And uh, when they deregulated uh, Wall Street, that's when they changed the nature of capitalism. It became financialized. And uh, it's going to be very hard to get uh, that uh, toothpaste back in the tube. What book says that, tells us that? 
Right here. Right in here? Okay. All right. Uh, I, I, but so you know, it was Reagan deregula deregulating. It was the power of the unions decreasing. Correct. Those two things. Together. Uh, together. Not, the, the key upset rule the balance. Yes. The key rule change was 1982 when uh, stock and cent, up until that point, uh, uh, stock buybacks were called something else. They were called stock manipulation. You're not supposed to influence the price of your own stock by through market manipulation. So up until 1982, from mid-30s to 1982, you could only take 2% of your profits uh, and use it for stock buybacks. Once they deregulate that, it went from 2% to 70% by the time of the crash. Today, it's, it's, it's up close to 60 again. It went down and up close to 60. Catch this. Some companies spend more than 100% of their profits on stock buybacks. How do they do that? We don't have time. So they borrow the money. <laughs> anyway. They're going to have to... People, it's all in there. All right. Does the book tell you where to order this, or you order it regularly just online? It's on, you can you get can it online, that. and you can and get please, it on our website. Really, read this book, because you'll really come with a deep understanding of what's going on and really a great desire, I think, for justice. Yes, and by the way, all the profits go back into the Runaway Inequality Education good. Project. I'm not getting anything out of it. That's so good. Les Leopold, thank you very thank much. Thank you.